the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with the renowned screenwriter James V. Hart. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David G. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got a really special guest. His work on the silver screen has been responsible for some of the most beloved classics of the 80s and 90s, from Steven Spielberg's Hook to Muppet Treasure Island to Bram Stoker's Dracula to the Robert Zemeckis film Contact. He's worked with the best and brightest minds of cinema. Uh, here to chat about his incredible career and the movies we all love is none other than screenwriter James V. Hart. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight has been responsible for writing some of the most beloved movies of the 80s and 90s, from Steven Spielberg's Hook to Coppola's Dracula to Muppet Treasure Island and the incredible sci-fi classic Contact. He's left his mark on each decade with his phenomenal screenwriting. He's also worked with some of the, the greatest director of directors of modern times. Here to chat about his incredible career is none other than James V. Hart. James, welcome to the show. Thank you. I didn't realize I'd done all that. It's nice to hear. It makes me feel good. <laughs> So, um, I mean, you've you've had an absolutely incredible career in the movie business, but I'm kind of curious as to how that journey initially started. Did it manifest itself in some early interest in films? And oh yeah, and oh things? yeah. No, my my dad was a big uh, movie buff, and uh, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and um, he would pop popcorn uh, and put my brother and I in the back of the car and and take us to the drive-in with mom. Uh, and uh, that started our habit of going to the movies. And then we had a theater uh, called The Gateway. It was like a neighborhood theater. And mom would drop us, you off on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock uh, for 25 cents. You spent the whole day in the movies. You got a double feature, uh, a bunch of cartoons, probably four or five serials. Uh, and then we'd walk home and we would act out the movie we the neighborhood kids we'd all get together and act out the movie um and i remember when we saw spartacus we went home and and chopped all of my mother's flowers to bits and doing the the sword fights you know yeah um uh and it was uh, we it was i grew up loving the movies and i never knew you could do them you know so finally uh my dad got an eight millimeter camera and we started making little films you know i get the neighborhood kids and put the hat, cowboy hats on or whatever we'd use firecrackers for gunshots uh so and and the gateway became kind of a cultural all through high even through high school i grew up going to the gateway so even in high school when you got to high school it was friday nights and you were instead of watching a movie you were trying to put your arm around a girl or something you know but but you still went to the movies and i saw i got an education in uh, in watching films of the gateway and then my dad would let me stay up late and watch what they called the million dollar movie, 11 o'clock. And that's where I saw the old Errol Flynn films and, and fell in love with, uh, with the great films of the thirties uh, and the forties. So didn't have film school. I, I did go to film school. Um, I went to SMU, which was un, unheard of for a film school. Um, and I think there were 30 of us in the class in the, in the, in the whole department. But our the head of the department had such great connections. Um, I got to meet George Roy Hill with a, a print of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid that no college group had ever seen. He brought it all the way from Hollywood to show us. Uh, Alan Pakula brought his first films to us. I got to see Dustin 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 uh, Dustin Hoffman Dennis Hot didn't know Dennis, Dennis Hopper. Hopper and and. Um, uh, the he came with Easy Rider. Yep. Um, and um, uh, and at that time we didn't. Nobody knew who he was, but um, he brought Easy Rider along with Jack uh, to show in our little tiny theater. And I got to watch coeds put their phone numbers on Jack's arm because we didn't have texting in those days. But we got to see Easy Rider, you know, in, in advance. So I, I and I thought everybody got to do that, and it was an amazing time. Uh, in the in the sixties and seventies, to because the business was exploding. Um, L.M. Kit Carson, 
who, if you don't, people don't know, one of the great journalists and great filmmakers and great writers, Texas writer started, got Wes Anderson started. Um, he showed a documentary film he made that made a lot of uh, noise in those days, uh, Diary, David Holt Diary. And I asked a couple of questions after the screening, and he said, you and I are going to go have coffee. So he singled me out and took me to have coffee and said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to write. You're going to be in this business. Uh, and that really was kind of the the start. Um, we made films and um, uh, in Texas, and we and my partner and I drove to California uh, in his Ford van, and we had a 16 millimeter movie. We sent it to Coppola. We sent it to Dennis Hopper. We, you know, and I remember sitting in Coppola's office in those days, Zoetrope, which was the mecca in San Francisco, and um, my partner and I waited every day for a week in the outer office to meet Co Coppola and his receptionist said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Coppola's busy. And I'm sorry, you know, he's, uh, he's tied up today and said, well, he must've seen our movie. We sent him our movie. We, we want to talk to him. And finally on Friday, I remember she said, well, he's leaving town for two weeks and he really won't be able to see you. This is 1970, right before the Godfather. Um, but Zoetrope is making, you know, yeah. noise. And um, all of a sudden I see his big bushy head coming down the hallway and I elbow my partner and say, he's scared there. And and he opens the door and we're going, Mr. Coppola, Mr. Coppola, we're the guys from Texas. Did you see our movie, Mr. Coppola? And I'm sure the dragon lady behind us was going, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't say a word. He pivoted on his heels, headed back down the hallway, waved over his shoulder and said, keep making movies. And my partner and I looked at her and went, wow, Francis Ford Coppola just told us to keep making movies. We had no idea we were being blown off. You know, we took it all very positively. Uh, Threw you the so old bone. Oh, yeah. So years later, I mean, he actually got my friend a job on a Corman film. So years later, when I was able to sit with him on Dracula and recounting that story, he said, he said, well, you know, I don't remember any of that. And I had people like you in my office all the time, you know, but it was that was kind of our beginning. There was no there were no walls. Oh, I take it back. There was a wall. I have found out that that uh, a friend of my uh, a cousin of my aunt, my of my aunt ran the animation division at Warner Brothers. And um he renders a meeting with one of the top executives there on this screenplay that my partner and I had written. Um, and we went to meet, we got, went into the gate and Warner brothers and we're on the lot going, wow, we're, you know, we're here and we go into the executive office and we sit and wait and we're in our beads and long hair and bell bottoms and sandals and, you know, probably bad mustache or something. And we go and sit in the office and it's got all these, you know, awards and shit on stuff. And I'm not going to say the executive's name. Uh, and he comes into the office, does not sit down, but stands behind his desk and said, I read your script and I had the story department read your script. And we're going, oh, yeah, OK, great. You know, and he points out the window and he says, you see those walls out there? And we go, yeah. And he said, they're, to, they're there to keep people like you out. Jeez. And it was a very short meeting. You know, thank you very and much. This was, was this Warner Brothers? It's Warner Brothers, yeah. Warner Brothers, okay. Same trip with it. But that was our introduction to the Francis Ward Coppola said keep making movies. And the executive Warner Brothers said those walls are to keep you out. So that was our triumph, my triumphant trip to Hollywood. You know. Uh and when I was just stri uh, striking and anyway, we were marching outside Warner Brothers just this last strike, and I'm with my son, who's also writer's guild, and so is my daughter. And I'm walking by that office window in that wall and it uh, had a huge flashback on this is where I began. Now I'm striking, <laughs> you know, now I'm picketing. You know, uh, again, those walls were trying to keep us out. So long winded answer. Sorry, you got me going right off the bat. So <laughs> the, um, so during this whole course of things, I mean, did you have full parental support or were they concerned about the old, uh, starving artist thing? It's really, it's a good question. I think my dad, my mom was, uh, was in the arts. She was a uh, played musical instrument, and she taught school. And she was, you know, uh, and all through 
high school, we'd done play theater and really he would be business. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. I got they they had the lottery, so suddenly I had four years of my life that you know that was handed back to me, and they were actually very supportive. Uh, we raised money in Texas for my first film. That's how I met my wife. We shot it all over Europe. Um, it won a lot of festival awards. My dad ended up investing, um, and I think that they recognized that where this passion and desire. When my brother was a world champion flautist, I mean, he we're from Fort Worth, Texas, and he's going to conservatory and. New England and I'm going to LA to make movies. And, and it was, a um, they, and they, they supported our desires. You know, they supported that I wasn't going to go in the family business, neither was my brother. Um, so we, I, we were really fortunate. We had a lot of support from them all, all the way through our, our careers. Was there any point in those early years where you considered quitting the movie business and transitioning to like a more conventional or stable line of work, or was it foot on the gas, you know, blinders on, this is what you want to do all the yeah, way. Yeah. But that's a good question too. Cause there's so many times you, I mean, every day you want to quit the business, you know, you get so frustrated or fed up with it or something or, or it's just too much. Um, I didn't know what else to do. I mean, I didn't write for a long time. I, I, I'm the first movie first couple of movies I made, I produced and raised money. I didn't write. Uh, and those movies were costly in terms of, of time and energy and personal relationships. Um, and I think that is when I said, what else can I do? You know, it's too, I don't, I don't want to be an accountant. Uh, I, I bagged my law degree and I didn't, I took the law boards and said, I'm not going to law school. Uh, I, I didn't know what else to do. The movies was all I ever wanted to do. And so I started writing, um, which seemed to be what I was supposed to do. That was, I guess that was, it's either get out of the business or do something else. So I started writing and it turned out to be, that's what I was supposed to do. So, but yes, every, I think every day you wonder, why am I in this crazy business? Even when things are going well, you go, well, I don't know. Will they go well much longer? I don't know. Uh, and when, especially when you have a dip or you have a, um, a, a sagging moment in your career when you're going, okay, I'm done. I probably reinvented myself 10 times where I've been on the bottom and then came back up to the top and went around to the bottom, came back up to the top. Yeah. Um, but for instance, nobody wanted to do hook. Nobody wanted to do Dracula. My agents fired me. Um, you're too old. You don't have anything done while I was writing hook and Dracula. So um, they, they wanted me to quit. <laughs> And, and when I finished Hook and Dracula, that was a real big resurrection because I was on the bottom. You know, we were done. I uh, hadn't had anything made. I was in my 40s and um, it looked pretty grim. So you just, you don't give up. Well, speaking of, give up. of Hook, one thing that really fascinated me in researching for this interview is the timing and the differences between your debut feature film script, give me an F and your, <laughs> I guess your sophomore film hook. I mean, that's, that's an incredible difference in scope and scale and subject matter. How did that first screenwriting job come about? And what do you think it did to prepare you for what was to come next with hook? Well, uh, give me an F was autobiographical. I was a male cheerleader at SMU and, 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 at, and in my high school in Fort Worth, um, which I thought was fascinating because uh, male cheerleaders were, were supposed to be, uh, either gay or um, uh, or perverse or something. You know, we were not, we were not, we were, it was not, it wasn't a sport. And in Texas, you played sports. <laughs> so I did track and I was a cheerleader. I wrote uh, the script to give me an F um, and it was raunchy. I mean, it was like Porky's or, you know, it was before Animal House. It was raunchy. And it was, it was depicting the women and the girls that I had worked with um in, in a way that I got to know them very differently than most people do. And I mean, how they talk, what their, what their ha bad habits are, um, how, the, how they view men, you know, I mean, it was, it was a, a raunchy romp. And um, when it got made, it didn't get made the way I wanted it to. It was, it was uh, toned down and kind of cheesy and there's some really good stuff in it, but it didn't have that savage, R-rated mm -hmm. women talking like like we've never heard them talk before. That was later for Slapshot when somebody else, you know, 
later for animal all that stuff. So when that failed, that was must have been eighty four. When that failed, um, I still had a and I and I had and I had, was trying to have a writing career. Um, in those days, I got a lot of development deals. Where I mean, I wrote for Redford Newman. Uh, I wrote for for uh, a, a number of kind of star kind of vehicles. None of them got made. Mm. But every time I would write one, I would get bigger. It would I would take on a bigger scope. And finally, I wrote a big sci-fi script that Frank Marshall uh, wanted to do with Steven Spielberg, and that was in 1982. And that kind of changed things. Uh, suddenly, the I was writing for a bigger canvas. You know, I wasn't writing a. I, I refused to do comedy ever again after my experience. I didn't give me enough because of how badly they turned it around. So I said, went back to fantasy, which is what I grew up with: sci-fi, pirates. You know, I was a I was a Captain Hook fan when I was in first grade. Uh, the idea for Hook came from my son Jake, who was in six years old. He's now our writing partner, um, and it's that dinner table game we would play called What If, and it was we would stand fairy tales on their heads you know what if cinderella's glass slipper didn't fit you know what if what if uh, uh prince Jeremy had bad breath you know what if frodo's ring didn't fit you know and finally jake said what if peter pan grew up and i went no 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 that's you know that's taboo uh, everybody knows that peter pan didn't grow up and he didn't went, yeah dad but what if he did and the light bulbs went off, the bells, you know, the heavens opened up. And we, as a family, we created that story that night at the dinner table. And I was terrified. Uh, this was Walt Disney. This is, I mean, this is all the stuff you, you, this is, this is blasphemy. And I was afraid to even tell my agent about it. Um, and everybody in town turned it down. Everybody. Nobody wanted to do a grown up Peter Pan. Uh, couldn't couldn't fathom it. It was it would be a disaster. Um, and then we got a uh, an opportunity to do it at Sony as a kind of a, a gimme of to throw me throw me a bone deal mm -hmm. with Nick Castle, who is a wonderful director. I, I loved his film Boy Could Fly. And it would be great for the film. So we spent a year writing that script with nobody paying any attention to it. It was never going to get made. Nothing was ever going to happen with it. At the same time, I was writing Dracula. Same thing. Nobody wanted to do it. We did it at USA Network or, or Wilshire Court for like a TV movie. Nobody cared. And um, so those two scripts came in and things happened. Uh, Mike Metavoy read Hook and went, wait a minute. This is, well, where has this been? I wanted, this is a big movie. Um, uh, Coppola read Dracula. Thanks to Winona Ryder. Um, and he said, um, uh, you know, is it who's directing? Um, so almost, you know, I was the overnight success that took 20 years. And suddenly the two biggest directors in the business wanted to do those two scripts. And I had been fired by my agent, and no, but nobody wanted to represent me. So I guess there was a there was that place in between Gimme and F and Hook where you got a lot of of practice writing and getting paid to do it. You know, the kids would come home from school and say, we tell everybody you're a screenwriter. They want to know what movies have you made? And I didn't have any. I had a wall of unproduced scripts. So I think that time between Gimme an F and, and writing hook was a, a great training ground for me. And also I had kids and that's what that changed everything. When I had kids, I never would have written hook if I hadn't had kids. Was there a moment in the film that when you finally saw it on screen, you were surprised at how incredible it turned out? Um, well, this is interesting because that's a whole, I can, we can do a whole thing on hook. Um, the shoot, the shoot was very difficult. Um, Malia Scott's Marmo was on writing with me. Stephen had other writers come in on hook. Um, I was seeing things that were not getting shot or they were getting changed uh, that I would slip him faxes uh, on Sunday night. To, to, this is what you're, you know, the next morning it would show up in the script as if written by somebody else, which is fine. Um, and I was concerned because they didn't want to kill Rufio. Stephen did not want to kill Rufio. 
he didn't want toodles in the movie. You know, there were things that were being decided that I thought were making going to make the movie more juvenile with, with less. I mean, if you, if Rufio didn't die and all you got in Neverland is marbles and tomatoes, you know, there's no jeopardy for, for Peter. There's no jeopardy for the father and the kids. So uh, I remember sitting in my little office there at Sony when I was working on Dracula and the stunt double who, had, who did work for Robin came and stuck his head in and said, we're going to, we're going to kill Rufio. And I knew that somehow the message had finally got through that, if there's no real jeopardy in Neverland, what's there's no if we don't lose somebody we care about, if so somebody doesn't die, you know, and it turns out that Dante Bosco, who played Rufio, turned that into an iconic character, and that his death scene impacted so many young people when they saw it. They still the first thing they talk to me about when they see me is Rufio. And what an impact that death scene had. So uh, I think I'm answering your question. Um so when I finally saw the finished film all by myself in a screening room, that's what you do with the Writers Guild, I was knocked out. I mean, I, I knew what the great Michael Kahn went through to, to construct that film in the editing room because it's not the way Stephen shot it. It wasn't the continuity of the film is not the continuity of the way Stephen shot the film. Um, I, 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 think he I, needed, mm -hmm. I think he needed six more months on the script to really make it his. And... Uh, the I was I was blown away, and my family wouldn't speak to me after they saw it. For several hours, they would not speak to me because they knew what wasn't in the film. Mm. So the fact that the audience loves it, we're and now my family is the same way. Everybody's the, the audience embraced that film and made it the success that has long legs. I mean, the afterlife on that film is amazing. Mr. Spielberg doesn't like the film. Uh, and has often criticized it, and he has no idea what, he, uh, in spite of his, his success, um, and it 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 works constantly over and over and over again. People will come up to me and go, "We watched. I just showed this to my son or my child, or I just showed this to my grandkids, or we. I remember when the first time I saw. You know, they've all people. So many people were impacted by that film, uh, even though it wasn't deemed a success at the time." I thought I'd read right. somewhere that Spielberg wanted it to be a musical. Maybe was that uh, well was that, that, thing? that that musical soundtrack is now out. It just came out on a special edition of John Williams' um, um, soundtrack, including all the songs. There were I think there were four songs or five songs recorded. Yeah, he wanted to, Stephen had always imagined doing Peter Pan as a musical. The that was what he wanted to do, not Hook. So. He, uh, Leslie Brickus and um, Anthony Newley and John Williams, they did they did five songs. Um, they filmed two of them. One was a big pirate number when they come into the with the hook. That was a big musical number. Hmm. Uh, and um, there was two. There were two other songs. One, one that um, Mom um, Caroline Goodall sang as, as Moira. Um, the other song was a beautiful song when you're all alone and they just didn't work. They, they, they were not consistent with the tone of the film. So some of that footage is somewhere. I remember seeing a cut of with, with, with a couple of the musical numbers cut into it. And I think Steven realized that it just, it was, it was, he, it should have been conceived as a musical from the beginning. You couldn't just take the story that I had written and wedge turn it into a musical unless it was conceived that way from the very beginning. That would have meant that Maggie Smith would have had to have a song, you know, mm -hmm. in London. I mean, you, it would, have, it couldn't just be a musical in Neverland. So yeah, that's what, that was his, one of his original conceits that he wanted to do in a musical. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A special thanks to James V. Hart for joining us. James will be back again next week. So please tune back in. Stay safe, everyone.